So on November 24th of 1983, one of the most famous episodes of TV aired on Thanksgiving Day. It was on PBS, and it was an episode of Sesame Street. And on the episode, uh, the real-life actor that had played the character of Mr. Hooper, Will Lee was his name, he passed away the previous year. And the writers and producers were trying to figure out how they were going to address this with the children. Were they just going to ignore it and move on or say that he'd retired? And they decided to actually explain death to their young audience on that day, uh, that Thanksgiving day. And so in the scene, uh, the adults are all hanging out at Sesame Street, and Big Bird shows up with a drawing of Mr. Hooper, and he wants to give Mr. Hooper his drawing. But they have to explain to him again that Mr. Hooper has died. And Big Bird goes through uh, various questions, uh, asking why did this have to happen? I don't understand. Why is he not coming back? And he doesn't like it. And Big Bird takes on the, kind of the perspective of a child, a four-year-old. And it's kind of a, a, an interesting episode of Sesame Street, largely because when you think of Sesame Street, you think of happiness. You think of joy. You think of something not heavy. You think of lightheartedness. And dealing with something like that, something like grief, is a pretty heavy thing for a child, especially one as young as four, which was what their target was, to deal with. I think many of us live our lives like we're on Sesame Street, and that grief and sadness and tragedy isn't ever going to come our way. And when it does, we are wholly unprepared to deal with it. We're surprised, in fact. Like, I thought I was supposed to live a really easy life. I thought I was supposed to live this charmed life. Why is this happening to me? We become like Big Bird. We ask questions. We struggle with it. And that's all okay. But our society doesn't really help us because our society tells us to be happy. And the thing that, that's supposed to make you happy is doing what? Whatever makes you feel good. And grief doesn't feel good. Therefore, in our minds, we've taken grief and we've put it over here. And we've taken happiness and we've put it over here. And we've said those are mutually exclusive ideas that can never touch one another. And as we continue this study of the Beatitudes on how to be a happy people, we see that Jesus directly refutes that concept of grief and happiness being so separated. He says there's actually a link between them. And so we're talking about how you might be a happy person. And we're looking at the second Beatitude today. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. We're going to ask the question, how is it I can find happiness in the midst of my grief? So we're going to look at Matthew 5.4. We're going to look at some others as well. But we're going to follow the path of asking the question, who are we? Who do we want to become? And then how do we get there? So the first question, who are we? Well, we are a people that don't like to grieve. We don't want to grieve. Matthew 5.4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, or happy are those who mourn, because they will be Comforted. That's what Matthew 5, 4 reads. And so the second of Jesus' statements about how to be happy gives us yet another interesting, what's called a makarism, uh, because it starts with the word makarios. It's the Greek word for blessed or happy. Happy is probably a better interpretation. And the Greek word there for mourn is pentheo. And pentheo means to experience sadness because of some life circumstance. It means to grieve. Now when we read this statement... From Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, or happy are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. It sounds weird to us. We think, wow, that's really strange. There must be a cultural difference between us in 2018 and those folks in like the 30s AD. No, it would have sounded just as strange to them as it sounds to us now. The idea that grief and happiness somehow go together would have been just as foreign of a concept to them as to us. Because we all experience life circumstances that lead us to grieve. We all experience things that make us sad, that devastate us. Uh, Jack Martin told me this week that you experience grief any time you go through a loss. You experience grief any time you go through a loss. This doesn't necessarily have to be the loss of a loved one, although that's usually where we encounter it, and it's usually the most extreme form that we encounter, but it can be the loss of, of your marriage. It can be a failed marriage. It can be a rough patch in your marriage where you recognize things are never going to be the same again. There's a new normal for us. 
It could be the loss of a child. And not necessarily the death of a child, but looking at the life that your, your child has chosen and recognizing that it's only destruction and sadness for that child and thinking, that's not the path I had for you. And we grieve and we mourn because we know that something is being lost. You can experience grief when you lose a job. That's fairly common. You have a job that you love. It's providing a good lifestyle for you. And all of a sudden, boss calls you in and says, we're making cuts. And you're gone. It creates grief. You can even grieve over something that you never had to begin with. The death of a dream. Many people go through this when they're told for the first time, you're never going to be able to have children. There's all this grief that takes place over a child that will never be born. Over a dream that's dead. When you begin to think, I'll never be married. Or I'll never find that, that job or that calling that I want. You can grieve over something that's never existed. It's called the death of a dream. And grief, the, what separates grief from just sadness is there's this sort of knowledge, this feeling, this sense that whatever it is that you lost isn't coming back. It's not coming back. It's not returning to me. And so grief is essentially this feeling that something is missing, something's not right, and then experiencing that feeling on repeat, constantly. C.S. Lewis said this in the middle of his grief, Part of every misery is, so to speak, the misery shadow or reflection. The fact that you don't merely suffer, but you have to keep on thinking about the fact that you suffer. I not only live each endless day in grief, but I live each day thinking about living each day in grief. And so we're afraid to experience grief. We're afraid to even to touch it. Because we want to be happy. Our society tells us to be happy. Our society peddles us happiness, joy, excitement. It's very hard to sell grief and sell a product, right? Grief is something that we stay very far from. We're afraid to even touch it. And so we come to Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 4, and we think probably what a lot of his disciples thought. That sounds crazy. That sounds pretty extreme. But the Bible gives us three chief reasons to grieve. Three chief reasons to grieve. You can have personal grief over a loss. You can see this in John chapter 11. Uh, Jesus is, receives word that one of his friends, Lazarus, uh, is sick, and they call him to come and heal Lazarus. Well, Jesus takes his time, and Lazarus dies. And he shows up on the scene, and when he shows up in John 11, verse 32, Mary and Martha, Lazarus' uh, Lazarus's sisters, meet him, and they say, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. At no point in this exchange, you see Mary and Martha weeping, you see the Jews weeping, and Jesus even grieves over it. At no point in this is anybody rebuked for it. Jesus doesn't say, hey, lighten up, I'm here, I'm God, I'm going to take care of this, get over it. No, Jesus enters into the grief with them. If you're grieving over something today, there is at no point where Jesus will make you feel guilty over that grief. We can grieve over wickedness in the world. Turn with me to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness." the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The people of Israel are being told that Babylon is going to come in and it's going to destroy the nation of Judah and they're going to be hauled off to exile. And there's all these judgments coming through and there's mourning going on over all the wickedness, over all the evil in the world. And God steps in and says, I'm going to comfort you in the midst of that. 
It is okay to grieve, to turn on the news, to see a sad news story and just be upset and devastated by it. But it's also okay to grieve over personal sin. Psalm 51, verse 1 says this. This is one of my favorite psalms. And it's apparently, according to tradition, what David wrote after his sin with Bathsheba. He says, 51 verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Deliver me, this is verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God says it is okay for us to look at our own life to see things that we have done where we failed to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and where we failed to love others as ourselves and it is okay to grieve over that. It's okay to be sad over that. Now there's a fine line between grief and shame and we'll talk a little bit about what that is later. But it is okay to look at your life and see places where you have hurt others and hurt God and enter into sadness about it. You don't have to just move on from it. It's actually a good grief, and we'll talk about what that is. But because we're such a people that hate grief and being really uncomfortable in any sort of situation, we typically handle grief like Big Bird. We run from it. We stuff it. Or we ask questions about it, trying to discern an answer. In the episode where Big Bird learns of Mr. Hooper's death, he essentially asks four questions. And these are four questions that children typically ask when they're explained death for the first time. Big Bird asks, why isn't Mr. Hooper coming back? And we ask the same question of God. Why isn't it coming back? Why don't I get restored to me the things that I lost? Why don't I get this back? Big Bird asks questions about Mr. Hooper, Mr. Hooper made him birdseed milkshakes. And he wanted to know, who's going to make my birdseed milkshakes now? We immediately turned to our needs. Well, God, this person was this, this way in my life, or I needed this job, or God, I kind of had my dreams pinned on this. What about my needs? Who's going to meet those needs? And we ask God that question just like Big Bird. We say we don't like it. We say, God, why is this making me sad? It says in your word that you're supposed to bring us joy and you're supposed to bring me happiness. Why am I sad, God? I don't like this feeling. Or we just say we don't understand. God, everything was just fine. I had a job and and it put food on the table and we came to church and we worshiped and we we did our best to love you according to what you said. Why have you done these things to us? And we grieve. There's nothing wrong with feeling those feelings. But if we just stay there, then we'll never learn what grief can teach us. We'll never engage with what grief can offer us. And Jack Martin, who's our pastor of ministries, one of our pastors here, he has some words to say about what grief might show us. Watch the the video of Jack. You know, I work with a lot of people who go through death. And... um, experience the death of a loved one. I don't know if people can really grasp God without going through something really traumatic or terrible. I know that sounds really odd and I'm not not trying to be a sadist, but I think we get the idea that we can just sit down with our Bibles and we can understand God. The way it works is we walk through life and we have his word and we and we read truths from his word, but we we don't understand those truths until we go through things that are really rough. And the people that do that, the people that go through the rough things, they develop a track record with God. But the people that wrestle with God, that that get down in the trenches with Him, and He gets down there with us. The people that call out to God and say, I am in agony. I am in pain. I don't know what to do. 
I don't even know if I can live to tomorrow. Uh, and they see God at that point come into their lives. They have a totally, totally different understanding of God at that point. They read scripture differently. They understand his love, his care, his compassion. I ask, um, in grief share, I go around and I say, are you closer to God now or are you further away from God after the grief, after having lost a loved one? And to a person, it's not a flippant answer, but to a person they'll say to me, I'm much closer to God because we can't be closer to God until we walk with Him, until we allow Him to walk with us through terrible times, through this life that we live. Jack is a phenomenal pastor and minister, and if you are going through something difficult, you want Jack Martin walking with you uh, through that. But as Jack said, you can't handle grief. You've got to be able to enter into it. You've got to be able to walk through it with Jesus. And so none of you, probably, I hope, watch Sesame Street still. And so we can't handle grief just only in the way that Sesame Street taught kids to handle it. We've got to move past that. And so what we need to see is that comfort can really only come through grief. Comfort can only come through grief. Jesus gives us the reason why experiencing grief is makarios, which means happy or fortunate or even lucky. Why having grief is a fortunate circumstance. It's because everybody who experiences grief has the possibility of experiencing comfort from God. Without grief, without experiencing pain and sadness, you'll never know the joy of comfort. Now, I'm not trying to say that God inflicts upon us pain and suffering so that we'll come to him. That is, that is a little bit of an abusive relationship, that God doesn't do that. But when we encounter pain and suffering in our lives, God does desire for us to come to him. There's a movie, a great movie. Uh, it's a Pixar movie, of course, because all great movies are Pixar movies. It's called Inside Out. And so it's from 2015. I'm going to do spoilers. You're late to the game. I'm sorry. But in the movie, uh, it's, by, it's directed by a man named Pete Docter. And if you don't know who Pete Docter is, he is a believer. He's an evangelical Christian. And so if you wonder of the Christian themes in Pixar movies, you're probably right. They're there. And in the movie Inside Out, it's, it's dealing with emotions and kind of the emotions that drive us. And so the story is told about a, a, an 11-year-old girl and the emotions that are inside of her. And so there's five emotions that are discussed uh, or that are shown. Uh, joy, sadness, fear, disgust and anger who's my personal favorite and it, they're kind of controlling her they kind of it's almost like they have control of like this automaton uh, and at one point in the movie uh, joy and sadness get sucked out into the other parts and they get taken out of the control room and joy is constantly in the, in charge trying to make sure that the little girl is as happy as she possibly can be and so she relegates sadness to a corner of the of the control room don't touch anything don't mess with anything and it's a really great film because as the characters develop, you realize that a lot of the memories that make the little girl her and a lot of the memories that are thought of so happily actually started out in the midst of sadness. And so Joy finds out that a lot of her favorite memories are actually sadness's favorite memories too because they started off sad and they become happy. And what changes the memory from sadness to joy, from sadness to happiness, is this idea of comfort. There's a moment where her family or friends come around her and comfort her. And so the Bible has a lot to say about comfort, primarily in 2 Corinthians 7. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 7. We'll be there for a little bit, but we see how we get comforted. One, we're comforted by God when we grieve a loss. When you grieve a loss, you're comforted by God. Look at verse 5 of chapter 7. So even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a little while. 
Paul's on one of his missionary journeys. And he's in the city called Troas. And he's having this kind of letter writing exchange with the church at Corinth. And things aren't going well. Their relationship is very strained. They've said some things. He said some things. It's, it's kind of a, a rough relationship. So Titus is carrying one of these letters, and he's waiting in Troas for Titus to show up to say, hey, are we in the Corinthians good or not? And so it's a little like when you're having a fight with your spouse or with a friend, and you're waiting on that text to come through after you've said I'm sorry, and you're waiting to see if everything's cool, or if it's just going to be like, mm-hmm. And so Paul doesn't have a cell phone, so he's just waiting on Titus. That's what's happening. And, he, and it's such a, the anxiety and the grief taking place in the midst of this has actually affected Paul's ministry. He tells us in the chapter 2 of this book, and as well as in verse 5, how they've, they've dealt with fighting without and fear within, that his struggle with the Corinthians, his grief over their strained relationship, is actually leading him to deal with difficulty in his ministry. He can't concentrate on his work because he's so worried about what's going on with them. And then his fear, his grief turns to joy because he's comforted by God. He says he's comforted by finding his friend Titus, by having his relationship stored with the, restored with the Corinthians, and then their desire also to make things right. And you might think, well, of course God comforted him. He got everything back. Everything he was worried about, all the grief, he got all that stuff back. Well, not exactly. One, he lost all this time in ministry focusing on grieving over a broken relationship. That time won't be restored to him. It won't be given back. But also, their relationship has now fundamentally changed. If you go through and read First and Second Corinthians, you'll see that the Corinthians level some pretty cruel charges at Paul. They say some pretty nasty things. And there's some things you just can't take back. And so their relationship changes, I'm sure. So no matter how much you've lost... No matter what changes you've gone through, whatever your new normal is after a loss, and maybe you haven't gotten there yet. Maybe you're still in the midst of grieving. You're not at the new normal. The new normal would sound nice compared to what you're going through. You need to know that God wants to comfort you. God wants to comfort you. God draws close to those who grieve. He seeks them out. He wants to bind up their wounds. Psalm 34, 18 tells us, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Isaiah 49, 13, The Lord comforts His people and will have compassion on His afflicted ones. Isaiah 61, 1, He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. God wants to comfort you in the midst of your grief. And so we're comforted when we lose something. But we're also comforted when we grieve over personal sin, over personal wrongdoing. Keep reading in verse 9. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. <clears throat> For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Paul tells them he's excited about their repentance. Repentance is a theological term, it's a biblical term, which means to change your attitude, change your action. So you're doing one thing, you stop doing that, and you turn and do another thing. So if you've ever been driving to work, you forgot something at home, you have to repent, turn around and go back. That's what repentance is. And so when we run from any kind of grief or discomfort in our life, when we take grief and any feeling of grief, any kind of discomfort, and we shove it down or we run from it, we're actually creating a situation where we, not lose, but we deaden our ability to feel conviction for sin. And so if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And the Holy Spirit, one of His jobs amongst many, is to convict us of sin. One of His other jobs is to comfort us. And so His conviction, if we run from grief, if we run from sadness, if we run from discomfort, we have a difficult time being convicted. 1 John 1.8 tells us that if we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we call God a liar and the truth is not in us. And so if you're one of those people that, that feels like you haven't done very much wrong, I'm not saying you're not a believer. But what I am saying is that you might want to examine your heart and see what it is and how it is that you're living your life. A.W. Pink tells us that the Christian who has stopped repenting has stopped growing. We need to all embrace the grief that comes from breaking God's law and failing to love God. Because in doing that, we can really have the comfort 
that God gives through His grace. Jesus tells us, those that have been forgiven much, love much. Those that have been forgiven for little, love little. There's a direct correlation there. And so, we now, because we've been comforted, we have a job to do. Our job is to comfort others. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There's a lot of words of comfort there. It's rather repetitive. That's good. In the very beginning of his letter, Paul tells you why you're being comforted. And it's not just so you can feel good, although that's part of it. You are comforted so that you can take that comfort and go and care for people who are hurting as well. Have you ever tried to, to talk someone, counsel someone through something you've never walked through and you have no experience with? You feel woefully underqualified. God's comfort is given to us so that we can then comfort others with the truth of the gospel. Otherwise, we have very little to offer. When somebody's going through a loss, you can say, hey, I know what that's like. I've been comforted myself, and let me share with you what God shared with me. Maybe you just sit there and weep with them because you know what it's like to hurt. One of the ways this looks is not just in personal relationships, but in dealing with people who have been oppressed or downtrodden. They live a life of grief because of injustice in their world. And it's our responsibility as believers to come alongside them and enter into their grief, to hurt with them, to pray that God would do something, to change their circumstance, to cry out to Him, to comfort them, to just hurt with them. Most of us don't like the idea of grief. But if you think of comfort as a bridge... There's only one way to get on that bridge, and it's on the grief side of things. Because on the other side of that bridge is happiness. And most of us, because we're so afraid of grief, and we're so afraid of feeling uncomfortable, we just stay as far away from grief as we possibly can, and so we never get to explore the bridge of comfort, and then subsequently go and find happiness. When I was in college, my friends and I took a road trip across the country, and uh, we wound up, we were, the end destination was San Francisco. And we get there, and we want to see the Golden Gate Bridge. And this was before Google Maps. Uh, so we're driving around, we're driving around, we're driving around. And we're like, we're where it says it's supposed to be, but it's not there. And then one of us, I don't remember who it was, says, I think I see some gold over there. Some red or whatever it is. Gold is probably not the best color description. If you work for Sherwin-Williams, you can tell me what it is. And so we look and we see that the bridge is completely shrouded in fog. And we couldn't find it. We this massive landmark, but we couldn't find it because it was shrouded in fog. That is how most of us deal with comfort. Because of our own anger at the grief we're going through, our unwillingness to confront it, the challenges that we face, we don't ever see that there's this glorious bridge there. It's going to take us from one side to the other, the comfort of Jesus Christ because it's shrouded in the fog of our own sort of issues. Comfort, and by extension grief, is really a diamond in the rough. God has blessed us with emotion. He's given us the ability to feel. So we can't just not feel grief. So how do we unearth this diamond in the rough? How do we start to find this elusive happiness in the midst of our grief? Well, we need to give Jesus our grief. We need to give Jesus our grief. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 49. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus is doing his thing. He's teaching, he's preaching, he's healing. And there's a man of standing in the synagogue who comes to him. His name is Jairus. And Jairus comes to him and says, My 12-year-old daughter is sick. I need you to heal her. And so Jesus says, Okay, cool, I'll go with you. And so he starts walking with him. And Jesus gets sidetracked. He gets distracted. There's a woman that needs healing. And on their way... He gets news that the girl has died, and that's where we pick up the story in verse 49 of chapter 8. While he was still speaking, that's Jesus, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. 
And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that some, someone, something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. We don't know much about Jairus. We don't know what it was like. We don't know what he did on a day-to-day basis, but we do know what he did on the worst day of his life. He went and found Jesus. On the worst day of his life, we know he was grief-stricken and he went and found Jesus. And we know that halfway through that journey, on the way of bringing Jesus back, he got news that his mission had failed. Imagine that feeling and thinking, oh my gosh, if I had just left a day early, if I had taken it more seriously, if I had just done something. We know that the people around him told him that Jesus couldn't help him because the girl was already dead. And we know that everybody else told him to just grieve over the girl. I don't know where you're at today, but you need to be like Jairus. And you need to give Jesus your grief. You need to give Jesus your grief. And this won't be a natural act. Because we want to hold on to our grief. We're afraid to give our grief. We're afraid to encounter our grief. And so it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that you can hand over to Jesus those things that you hold so tightly. And emotional pain and emotional trauma is something that we are very sensitive about. We're like a cornered animal. We don't want anyone to touch it. And so we're afraid to give Jesus our grief. But the voice of the Holy Spirit calls out to us, just like Jesus told Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that you can ever hope to believe and accept that happy people grieve. And so it's in turning to Jesus that we find that our grief can turn into happiness, that we can cross that bridge of comfort. So how do we do this? One, we need to give the grief of our failings to Jesus. We need to give the grief of our failings to Jesus. 1 John 1.9, which comes after 1.8, tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, If you've never confessed your sins to Jesus, you need to do that today. Because you have no opportunity for comfort. The grief that you feel over doing things wrong can't be comforted by God because they're comforted through His Son on the cross. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and was raised to life so that we might be comforted. So that God doesn't just have to say, yeah, you feel bad about your sin. But instead of saying that, God says, it's okay. Come, let me bind up those wounds. And so if you've never done that today, My hope is that you do confess, that you do turn to the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry. I know I've done things wrong, and I pray for healing. I'm sorry. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If you're a believer, guess what? Confession and repentance isn't a one-time action. It's something we need to do regularly. It needs to be something, a part of our daily walk with Christ. Because we daily do things wrong. It doesn't mean you're, you're, uh, you're you're not this awful person. It means you've been saved and you're being sanctified by the gospel. But one of the ways in which we're sanctified is through repentance, through confessing, through letting the light of the gospel shine on places of our life that are dark and that we're ashamed of and saying, God, I'm ashamed of this, but I need healing. And God says, don't be ashamed. The difference between grief and shame is purely this. Grief drives you to God and says, God, I'm so sorry. Please heal me. Shame makes you want to hide in the corner and you run from God. Grieve your sin. Don't be ashamed of it. Grieve it. So how do we do that? We change our attitude. Like I said, be grieved by your sin. Don't blow it off. And don't rank your sin and think, oh, well, I said something terrible to my wife, so I should probably apologize to her and the Lord about that. And so the next time it comes around, you don't say anything, but in your heart, you're thinking the exact same thing. According to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which we're studying in the Beatitudes, that's still sin. And so we need to confess that. Maybe not confess that to your wife. You keep, keep the peace a little bit. But confess it to the Lord. Change your actions. Don't keep doing the same thing you do over and over again. Pray about it. Ask God to help you. Change your story. Stop showing other people that you're perfect. Because you're not, and we know it, you know it. Tell people about your sin. You don't have to wear a shirt that tells everybody what it is. But you can maybe confess to one or two close friends and, and, and get restoration Give the grief of your loss to Jesus. 
Some of you today are just like Jairus. You've lost something. And I don't know how to tell you any more clearly. But Jesus wants to help you in the midst of your hurt. These are not small things to him. They're not meaningless things to him. Jesus wants to bring comfort. And so all I can offer you today, because I don't know your specific situation, is that God is always good. No matter what you're going through, he is always good. And you need to repeatedly tell yourself that because it's hard to believe in the darkness. God is always good and he always cares. Don't doubt in the darkness what you've heard in the light. And one day God will restore that which you have lost. It may not look like what you thought it would. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, one day Christ will return in a new heaven and a new earth and we will have restored to us those things that we've lost. Again, it might not look what you thought it would look, but there is restoration. And we need to give the grief of our world to Jesus. You turn on TV and there's really tragic things. We need to pray. We need to intercede for our world. We need to pray that God would change things. The psalmist constantly call out, How long, O Lord? How long? How long? How long will you let this go on? And we need to do the same. Crying out to God, How long, O Lord, are you going to let this happen? Look, you know what finally made the producers of Sesame Street deal with the subject of grief? It was that they knew that the kids would notice that Mr. Hooper was gone. And they knew that kids needed to be taught how to deal with, dealt with grief. And we also need to learn how to deal with grief. It's okay to grieve. Jesus tells you not only is it okay to grieve, but there's a bridge to cross of comfort that can lead you into happiness if you'll just let Jesus do this. I know you don't want to hurt. I know you want to run from it. I do too. I don't want to feel that way. But there's a treasure of happiness on the other side of that bridge of comfort if you will just enter into your grief and not run from it. It's good to grieve. Happy people grieve. So grieve. Grieve over what you've lost. Grieve over what you haven't yet lost. And find that happiness is there. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for, oddly enough, grief. Giving us the ability to mourn and to weep. And we see you even grieving, Lord God. Over your people, over their sin, and over the way the world is not perfect the way that you had intended. And Lord God, for each person in this room that's grieving, Lord, I know that you're grieving with them because you're grieving that they haven't turned to you. That they're trying to do it all on their own. And so God, I pray that we would let it go. That we would just turn loose of the grief that we have. And that we would give to you the grief that we have and say, Lord, here it is. Help me. Forgive me. Change me. Change this. And we know that you hear and we wait expectantly for your answer. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.